So this lecture is about In re Elster, an interesting recent case from the Federal Circuit. And so in Elster, the Federal Circuit rules that a refusal by the trademark office to potentially register the mark Trump too small under Section 2C of the Lanham Act violates the First Amendment. And the case raises some really interesting questions about the reach of the First Amendment in trademark law, the ability of the PTO to refuse registration of marks that don't perform the trademark function effectively, and finally, the ways that using trademark law to protect merchandising rights messes with trademark law. So let's get started with the background. So during the 2016 campaign for the Republican presidential nomination, Donald Trump and Senator Marco Rubio of Florida got into it. And Senator Rubio made these statements. Have you seen his hands? They're like this. And you know what they say about men with small hands? You can't trust them. And that led to this immortal debate moment. He hit my hands. Nobody has ever hit my hands. I've never heard of this one. Look at those hands. Are they small hands? <laughs> And he referred to my hands. If they're small, something else must be small. I guarantee you there's no problem. I guarantee you. Enter Steve Elster. He files an intent to use application for the trademark Trump Too Small, seeking registration of the mark for shirts. And that kind of suggests that this may be a merchandising play. That is, he's interested in selling shirts that have this term on it and that his interest is in selling them in the capacity of shirts that are displaying the slogan, and not necessarily of having Trump too small be a specific source indicator of a particular product. So the examining attorney refuses the potential registration. First, Section 2A prohibits registration of a mark containing matter that may falsely suggest a connection with persons living or dead. And second, Section 2C blocks registration of a mark that consists of or comprises a name, portrait, or signature identifying a particular living individual absent written consent. Now, citing Lafayre Rubio, Elster argues that the registration is appropriate because the mark is political commentary about presidential candidate and then later president Donald Trump that the relevant consumer in the United States would not understand to be sponsored by, endorsed by, or affiliated with Donald Trump. And so the refusal by the examining attorney is affirmed by the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board on Section 2C grounds. The board does not reach Section 2A. So on to the Federal Circuit. And it's important to keep in mind that we have a backdrop here of recent Supreme Court precedent that strikes down the ability of the PTO to refuse registration of marks on scandalousness or disparagement grounds. And those were the holdings of Mattal versus Tam, which struck down the disparagement bar, and Iancu versus Brunetti, which struck down the scandalous bar. Both provisions were struck down as unconstitutional viewpoint discrimination. Now for the 2C bar, the Federal Circuit treats Section 2C as content discrimination. And it's important to note that they continue the frame of Tam and Brunetti that registration is a First Amendment space. Now, it's absolutely true that nothing in Section 2C would stop Elster from using the phrase Trump too small, however he may wish to do it. However, the Federal Circuit, and again, following the lead of the Tam and Brunetti cases, says that the refusal to register a mark that has this kind of matter is a First Amendment issue. Whether Elster is free to communicate his message without the benefit of trademark registration is not the relevant inquiry. It is whether Section 2C can legally disadvantage the speech at issue. And so this is tricky because we have this ongoing problem that the existence of a trademark registration may make it easier to pursue an infringement claim against someone who is using that particular matter. And that kind of infringement claim against, you know, what, what is, you know, however vulgar it may be, of speech may lead to the registration facilitating an interference with rights of free expression, right? To, the, to whatever extent others may want to use the phrase 
Trump too small. Uh, and this is especially the case on merchandise. So you see this is another example where we have what goes on in one area of trademark doctrine, in this case, what is eligible for a mark or more specifically a, a registration puts pressure on other doctrines within trademark law to ensure that the rights that are granted aren't pushed too far, aren't pushed into a space where they may interfere with the free expression rights of others. And it's kind of odd that the Federal Circuit is so concerned with Elster's potential um, viewpoints, which no one is trying to restrict his ability to say what he wants, but he may be armed with a tool that may allow him to interfere with the speech of others to the extent that their speech may want to use the phrase Trump too small. In Elster, the Federal Circuit does not clarify the level of scrutiny, kind of continuing a trend in these kinds of cases. So it doesn't say if we're proceeding under strict or intermediate scrutiny, the statute as applied fails either way. And this is an as applied challenge. The court notes that there may be an overbreadth problem, but sticks with saying that the refusal is unconstitutional as applied without reaching whether there's an overbreadth problem as a facial matter. So in discussing the problem, it considers what the government proffers as the interests behind having a Section 2C bar, privacy and publicity. One, to protect the privacy interests of the individuals who are referred to, and that doesn't apply to Trump in this case, says the court, because he is a public figure and indeed a seeker of attention. And with respect to Trump's publicity rights, the ability, his ability to exploit his marketable persona, which is a state law cause of action, the interest Trump may have in his commercial identity has to be balanced against the First Amendment rights of others to comment upon him. And so Trump's publicity rights would not be able to stop somebody from using, from, from merchandising the term Trump too small, and therefore that's not an adequate interest to justify the refusal to potentially grant a registration if Elster is able to perfect his use of the mark. Okay, so that's what the Federal Circuit says. And it's interesting here that, you know, we're talking about privacy, we're talking about publicity, but we're not really talking about trademark interests. And so, well, you know, what's going on with those? And, and I wanna argue that Trump too small is not a good mark the way we normally think about trademarks. So imagine you're, you're operating a widget factory and you're in the market for a new brand name. And, and imagine further that Donald Trump is not the famous person that he is, right? And so Trump is just another word. Which mark looks better to you, Trump or Trump too small? And if it helps to return to reality and a world in which Donald Trump is Donald Trump, which looks better as a mark, Eagle or Trump too small? And so it seems to me that you know the the single word marks work better. And so and so why is that? Well, what do you need from your mark? You you need to have a repository of meaning that you are going to fill with answers to questions like what is this product? How good is it? Who is it for? How much does it cost? Who is behind the product, right? And in all those cases, you're going to need something that consumers can recall and pick out as distinct from your competitors. Your mark needs to be memorable and it needs to be distinctive. And is Trump too small easy to remember? Is it the kind of thing that buyers upon seeing it are going to think, oh yeah, that's a trademark? Or are they going to wonder what's going on, right? Is this some kind of political commentary? But you're not, in my hypothetical, you're not in the business of political commentary, you're selling widgets. And so on this logic, Trump or Eagle is a superior mark to Trump too small if we're dealing with a traditional trademark setting. Either has a significantly better potential for being mentally available to purchasers. That is, they're easier to remember. And neither of them brings specific non-source meanings as stark as a pejorative phrase like Trump too small. And so they're going to be easier for you to pair with other associations that you want to make with your product that you can use to promote sales. Now, in an earlier article, I've argued that trademark law systematically favors what I call, quote, empty vessels like this as better able to perform the trademark function. A mark can best serve as a receptacle of meaning when it does not bring market relevant or distracting information to the table. And if you know, my, my best evidence of this, I suppose, is that Trump, just standing alone, was a registered trademark long before Donald Trump was born. And you don't start to see you know, phrases using Donald Trump or you know, that kind of thing until much later in history. And of course, when Trump, once Trump becomes a famous figure, then they come you know, fairly frequently. Now, of course, 
Trump too small could be a trademark, right? You could imagine a circumstance in which it's an arbitrary, arbitrary grouping of words. And it does not, you know, to my money, mislead as to Trump's approval because it's obviously criticizing Donald Trump. And so it does not infringe existing Trump marks of which, you know, there are, there, there are plenty. So usually in a case like Trump too small, the trademark quality function would be, could, would be performed and protected, not by something in the statute, but by ordinary seller interests. And a, a normal, reasonable seller would not plausibly select the phrase Trump too small to identify and distinguish their goods. The market ordinarily promotes trademark quality without the need for trademark law to intervene. But of course, now back to reality in a way from my hypothetical, it was selected, it was selected by Elster. And this choice is plausible if his purpose isn't to brand goods, e.g. a label on a shirt, but rather to sell the mark as merchandise, that is the mark as the good itself, like the slogan on the shirt. And this takes us to the problem of merchandising in trademark law. There may very well be a market for t-shirts and other paraphernalia with this kind of message. And trademark law, controversially, allows trademark holders to claim merchandising rights over their marks. So for example, and I have another video on this that I'll link here if I can work the technology properly. Even though nobody thinks that a Boston Red Sox baseball cap has either the Boston Red Sox or Major League Baseball as the source, judges still let sports teams, universities, and other famous brands use trademark law to control the multi-billion dollar merchandising market that exists in the world today. And judges typically say that the consumers who see unauthorized merchandise are likely to be confused, not necessarily by source, but by things like approval, whether or not there was a licensing or an affiliation relationship between the mark holder and the creator of the merchandise. Now, this is really controversial. A lot of people hate this. I, I count myself among them. But this approach has a textual basis in the Lanham Act. And this results, of course, though, in monopoly rents for trademark holders. But there's a common widespread intuition, and if you look at the cases, you'll see judges falling back on this all the time, that letting copying happen by someone other than one authorized by the trademark holder would be a form of free riding, reaping where one has not sown. And the trademark holders in these cases deserve the profits, the logic being they're the ones who have developed the goodwill in the marks. And of course, you know, that's, that's something you can quibble with, and many would argue that, you know, at least when it comes to fandom, fans generate the meaning themselves, but certainly the mark holder has something to do with it on an intuitive level. But this creates a problem for trademark law for a variety of reasons. And of interest here, tied to the Elster case, it incentivizes the pursuit of low quality marks whose appeal is not, whose appeal is merchandise, is not created by the trademark holder. In other words, it enables a form of free riding, but not on the part of trademark defendants, but rather of the trademark holders or the people who are pursuing trademark rights. So to see this problem, see what I mean by this problem, you know, consider a popular merchandised mark, you know, so, so think about your favorite sports team or the university you attended or your favorite college team or what, what, whatever, you know, so some, some piece of merchandise that, that, that you like. And in these cases, do the marks that are being merchandised, do they perform the trademark function effectively in general? Right? So on the merchandise, for the reasons I said, no, but these are perfectly good marks in their home markets. Boston Red Sox identifies the source of baseball services independently of its licensing of baseball caps, right? Duke is a provider of education services independent of its licensing various Blue Devil merchandise. Suppose Volkswagen, the automobile maker, wants to get control of the market for keychains that use the VW mark as the, as the shape of the actual keychain. That right can't be leveraged unless VW also functions as a mark in the first instance 
in its primary role of identifying and distinguishing cars and not just complementary merchandise. And indeed, and indeed it does. And so in all of these examples, it's easy to see the argument. And again, you, you can argue with it, but you can see you, you can see the appeal of the argument that the mark holder, quote unquote, deserves control of the merchandising market as against others who are, you know, pejoratively say, said to be reaping where they have not sown. And again, I don't agree with this, but the appeal is intuitive. And if you read cases in this vein, judges fall back on it all, all, all the time. It's a very common intuition. But not all merchandising cases fit this pattern. And sometimes it's the merchandisers who are the quote unquote free riders. That is, they are trying to gain control of a mark as merchandise over which they have not created any kind of goodwill, but they are looking to capitalize on a cultural moment. And so for example, there have been a raft of applications seeking trademark registrations for the phrase, I can't breathe. And in the cases like that, if trademark rights were to be recognized by a court, that would not reward goodwill generated in a traditional market where the mark is actually used as a source indicator. Rather, it would enable exploitation of fame that the would-be trademark owners had nothing to do in creating. These are the kind of merchandised marks that are also especially likely to interfere with speech, the protection of which is the supposed rationale for the Federal Circuit's treatment of Trump too small. And so efforts like this place a lot of pressure on trademark doctrine. And recent First Amendment jurisprudence in the registration space, Tam, Brunetti, and now Elster, take away some quote unquote clean ways of excluding poor marks. And that's leading to greater pressure on less defined doctrines like failure to function. The idea that certain kinds of marks don't function as trademarks, don't perform a trademark function. So you can see that in the Trademark Manual of Examining Procedures with its restriction on granting registrations for informational matter. Merely informational matter fails to function as a mark to indicate source and is thus not registrable. And indeed, that was the mechanism used to deny attempted registrations in the phrase, I can't breathe. Now, there isn't a very fleshed out jurisprudence at the Federal Circuit on this method of excluding potential trademark registrations. And so this raises you know, the potential that the Federal Circuit may get into the game of second guessing the trademark office on these kinds of refusals. Now, we'll, we'll see what happens, but the bottom line is that the increasing prominence of First Amendment challenges to statutory, you know, not, not stuff that's coming out of the common law of the trademark office, but statutory registration bars disrupts an uneasy equilibrium that existed in trademark law. Now, again, as I said before, in a normal market, would-be trademark holders have an incentive to select marks that perform the trademark function well. The creation of the courts of the merchandising right alters these incentives. Now, again, for many mark holders, the merchandising right creates an opportunity to exploit the goodwill of existing, functional, perfectly adequate marks, albeit in a new and controversial market. But for some would-be mark holders, the merchandising right is an opportunity to pursue ineffective marks that lack pre-existing goodwill, but may nonetheless be profitable if a trademark monopoly can be established. The USPTO has some tools to moderate these pursuits, but the First Amendment is now removing some of them. In Ray Elster is a continuation of this trend, and it's placing more pressure on less established alternatives. And so as we watch this new equilibrium come into being, we should remember that the root cause of the dilemma is not the First Amendment, but a decades old decision by trademark doctrine to press trademark law into the service of non-trademark goals, of protecting the merchandising interests of mark holders. And that is what's causing the problem that we're seeing in cases like in Ray Elster.